So yes, thanks. I'm uh, Casey Overview Taylor. Um, I'm at Johns Hopkins University, and I've participated in several of the NHGRI uh, projects, including um, co-chair of the EHR Integration Workgroup of eMERGE, um, and I previously participated in the uh, IGNITE uh, SIG group, which is now the Clinical Informatics Working Group, and um, contributed to the ClinGen EHR Workgroup. So I'm going to talk about some of the uh, knowledge management tools associated with those project with those um, projects, and then also, uh, given the session yesterday that focused on uh, implementation science, uh, I, I changed some of my slides so that I can go through some of the frameworks within uh, the clinical decision support literature that might be um, relevant to kind of augment some of the some of the models that are being discussed in this venue. Uh, so just to um, to start this out, uh, I like to show this image to just uh, give an overview of the the vision for clinical decision support as a way of uh, bridging um, what's in personalized medicine into realization. And as you heard earlier yesterday, um, in terms of innovations being able to be seen in practice, they take 17 plus years. And so this is one of the approaches that could help to address this. Um, this is a, a paper that reviewed the literature from CDS on genetically guided per personalized medicine. They identified 35, 38 articles and concluded that to maximize the clinical benefits from ongoing discoveries in genetics and genomics, more research is needed um, in, uh, in this area to identify the best approaches. And so, as, as you know, this, this is fitting very well with uh, this idea of implementation science as well, and how do you implement CDS the best, uh, best way in order to address these barriers. Um, some of the barriers that were identified in, uh, in the literature and discussed included limitations to genetic proficiency of clinicians, limited availability of genetic experts, and gross growth of genetic knowledge bases. And so this is just an overview of the topics I'm going to go through. So uh, first, outlining some of the challenges for genomic clinical decision support and uh, talking about the implementation science literature and how it's uh, related to genomic decision support. Uh, I'm going to focus on some of the goals for eMERGE 3 in terms of genomic clinical decision support implementation. Um, then I'm going to shift a little bit to talk more about managing shared knowledge for, for genomic clin clinical decision support specifically and the tools to enable uh, knowledge management with a focus on NHGRI funded projects. So uh, this paper was published um, in 2013 and is, um, came out of eMERGE where uh, we highlighted some of the main challenges to um, implementing genomic clinical decision support. And the main points that were brought up in this paper are managing shared knowledge, uh, improving effectiveness in establishing decision support architecture and standard approaches. In terms of managing shared no knowledge, given um, the, f the focus of um, this talk, I just wanted to highlight some of the uh, papers that in inform um, these, uh, these challenges that were highlighted. So first, knowledge management solutions often are, are not accepted without customization, and that's something that's been found in clinical decision support li literature broadly. So this um, publication here highlighted that for, for several uh, clinical decision support demonstration projects. Uh, and the same is true for genomic de clinical decision support. Uh, this paper with several of the authors in the room um, highlighted that there's often a reliance on expert communities and so that's part of the customization activity that, that occurs is uh, getting input from expert communities. In terms of improving the effectiveness of genomic clinical decision support, uh, one of the main challenges is the lack of institutional and clinical acceptance of supporting evidence. And um, one way to kind of approach this challenge is to consider user interface characteristics, information content, integration of workflow and decision-making processes, and uh, 
while these are things that we suspect are uh, would improve uh, the acceptance of genomic clinical decision support. There's still work that's needed to really understand how those how those features translate into the acceptance of genomic clinical decision support. And so that um, so that highlights again the need for implementation science approaches and uh, inf informatics uh, approaches. Uh, the third point that was brought up is around decision support architecture and standard approaches for genomic clinical decision support. And uh, one of the main challenges is that there's a lot of variation in, in the architecture, and standards are very much needed to scale. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about standards because that's going to be discussed in, in uh, following sessions in a lot of detail. The main points that uh, people generally bring up in terms of limitations to using standards are that there's too many to choose from. And it constrains, when, once you choose a standard, it can constrain uh, what the user can enc encode uh, and so you're limited potentially in your scope. So uh, often uh, standards for genomics may need to be uh, refined to incorporate the scopes that, scope that you're interested in. So, uh, so within implementation science, uh, one of the key points I took away this uh, yesterday was uh, the was the identifying the what, and I really liked the. Um, uh, Peter Pro Provenos example where um, it was the process of uh, creating a checklist that actually improved um, improved outcomes and so um, there's a lot of effort that goes into that defining the what in in, uh, in terms of clinical decision support and um, for for seat for genomic decision support specifications um, the what is often uh, defined within the context of IT capabilities. And so it, it's um, clear in the literature that there's insufficient uh, decision support technology often, and so this can require additional IT development and resources, which, uh, which may or may not have been in the original scope of a project. And so um, when you're assessing capabilities, we, we'd, we'd love to often uh, you know, design a CDS tool that's separate from the EHR because maybe that's developed a lot faster. But if you want people to use it, it needs to be integrated in some of these, um, uh, the, the capabilities and, and the internal builds have to happen in order for that to happen. There are, uh, the good news is that there are some non-technical solutions to decisions to, um, for decision support that can be used. So one of the points that came up yesterday, for example, was a consultation service. So, so things like that can be non-technical. Um, and then often in these uh, studies and uh, in, in implementation that starts as a research protocol, uh, you initially may have a study team to support some of the processes that can um, later be translate, transferred into uh, technical solutions. And so there are some frameworks that exist from the clinical decision support literature to assess implementation challenges and to guide local approaches to implementation. Um, these are a couple that we um, described in the paper. And you see that there's actually um, very familiar concepts that are were discussed in some of the implementation science models. Um, but I think one of the, the one of the key things is that there is this focus on um, the tech, technology and software and hardware and aspect. Uh, in, in the paper, we also define this framework. Um, given that some of the existing frameworks that we that we assessed um, didn't really didn't address specifically what we were looking for. And so when we're defining the what gen genomic decision support do we need, uh, we, we can consider kind of three areas, the stakeholders, the transactions, and the, and the clinical systems. And these can be distilled out to um, questions around, around this. I think the, the key thing was uh, characterizing uh, what are common genomic testing processes that uh, clinical decision support could help enable. And um, this scope is, it has a healthcare provider, consumer, uh, and the consumer as two, two of the main stakeholders, but there could be other stakeholders that are not actually represented in this. But for, um, for our goals, this, uh, this seemed to fit a, 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 the examples that we were exploring. And so just to give a couple of examples here, 
um, first just going going through the overview of um, eMERGE 3, uh, when we apply the framework, it's pretty straightforward um, for what we were doing in eMERGE where uh, we're focusing on the end of this pipeline here. So this is very high level. There's a, a much more detailed version of all the steps that went into this. Um, but the, the current process within eMERGE 3 is to um, screen patients for uh, genomic sequencing. Uh, and so this involves um, the preclinical recruitment, which happens at the eMERGE sites, and then uh, the, the sample collection and sending to a centralized, one of the two centralized sequencing labs. Uh, both the VCF and raw data are retrieved and um, stored within the repository, and a report is uh, delivered to the sites, which also has um, uh, managing interpretations of the raw data uh, associated with those reports. So where we are now within the, at least the EHR integration work group, we're, uh, as we're seeing how we can leverage the EHR for processes for returning the results. Um, in terms of summarizing outcomes, that's, uh, there's an outcome work group that's doing much of, of that aspect. But when we're just thinking about using the EHR for return of results, uh, when we uh, consider this framework once more, uh, this, it's, this is again kind of like a high level simplification, but um, when you consider what are the relevant transactions, you're ret retrieving genetics and genomic test results. Uh, so that's one of these transactions that's listed here. Um, when should the activity occur? So the post analytics, so after the genomic lab uh, uh, re sends a report, and uh, how should it be initiated by who and is the healthcare provider who's receiving that re report and um, where should the data be pushed or pulled from. Um, it could be the EHR, um, but there, there could be other mechanisms. So this is kind of a discussion piece potentially. Um, another area, if we were to con consider other er uh, upstream uh, point for genomic decision support is for patient screening. And so in that case, um, the relevant transactions might be reported personal data, family history and pedigree data, um, and that would happen prior to genetic testing, and that could be in initiated by a healthcare's consumer, and the PHR could help ena uh, enable that. Uh, and so when you drill down even further after that very high level, you can um, think of like what is the, what is the CDS content uh, and uh, documentation templates for data collection is something that you'd have to build within the EHR. Um, and when that occurs, you have to define the setting. So maybe the outpatient setting, um, what's the workflow context? It could potentially happen between visits and um, by who this could be the patient and where should the data be pushed and pulled from. Um, this could be internal off-shelf functionality of the EHR and um, it could be active clinical decision support, although uh, it's the clinical, it's the CDS uh, features that should be, um, would be different in this context, context of active decision support. Um, so in this context, the trigger is time. So, uh, so maybe 24 hours after a patient visit and the, the input da uh, data element um, might be that they've um, they've had a visit, a patient visit, and the intervention in this case could be an email that says, "Can you fill out this um, this uh, documentation of your of your personal data?" And the choice in in this case is to either ignore that filling that out, or it could be um, actually completing it at that time. So these these are um, features of decision support that uh, are included in taxonomies that have been proposed by others um, involved in clinical decision support. So I'm going to um, move forward because we're getting low on time. So, uh, so I'm shifting a little bit just um, in the, in, uh, to, overview of managing shared decision support, and I'm going to go through very briefly um, the tools that are used for this. Uh, so this is uh, an overview of the kind of general steps for, um, for genomic clinical decision support in terms of how you would 
uh, envision this within sort of a, a, a learning health system view. So you would build and revise this genomic decision support based upon clinical practice guidelines. Often you can't, uh, there isn't, there may not be a guideline specifically for what you're trying to do. And so this is, this can be local policies or discussions around um, what is included in genomic clinical, clinical decision support. So I included that as a bullet. Uh, and, and once it's built, then you, we would want to publish the genomic clinical decision support, particularly in networks such as um, eMERGE and others. And so the computable gen genomic clinical decision support is often uh, captured locally. And um, in, in, eMERGE, in eMERGE's case, uh, the clinical labs also have structured interpretation that they're capturing as genomic decision support. And so this is kind of uh, the main area where uh, there are existing tools that can help address this. Uh, after something's been published, then it's being used, and you'll want to monitor the decision support. So uh, those are, th this, this process has been um, pretty much covered with, among uh, the group yesterday. So in terms of building and revising decision support, there, there's the Spark toolkit that was brought up yesterday, and I, um, that helps to provide guidance on the implementation project uh, process. And so um, I'm just pointing that out because it was discussed yesterday. I'm not going to, through it in detail, but I think that's one of those uh, is a tool that could be very useful there. And then um, better engaging stakeholders. I do think that this is an opportunity for new tool development. Um, and and there's not a, a lot in this is space this space currently, in terms of publishing genomic decision support. Uh, briefly, uh, these are three to, uh, these are four tools that um, have been discussed within uh, these groups. So I will the, the slides are shared, but I'll just point out the publication. So the genomic CDS sandbox is something that was brought up at a previous uh, genomic medicine meeting. Uh, that was focusing on genomic clinical decision support. And the idea is to have a sandbox to, that's made available with pre-configured genomic, um, genomic tools and clinical decision support so that um, you can try things out in the sandbox environment before implementation. And that's something that um, is envisioned but has not yet been uh, developed. Uh, also within ClinGen, uh, they, uh, created a HL7 compliant search interface for existing resources and provided guidance on how to, um, how to revise those resources so they're compliant. Uh, there's another tool that was developed within the eMERGE network led by Luke Rasmussen where um, it's called DocuBuild and we found that there are uh, several institutions that were, um, that were developing similar content and need, had the need to brand them in different ways or include local content such as um, reimbursement rules for their institution, but the core uh, text could be shared and potentially branded um, for their local needs. So it's just a tool to help with that. And uh, CDSKB is a large effort that includes both community engagement as well as a, collect a library of artifacts that can be contributed by community members who are involved in clinical decision support efforts. And so the focus to date has been on EHR integration, clinical decision support, and uh, technical implementation. And um, one of the really useful aspects of this site is the archived webinars where um, community members can present and everybody around the country can, can learn from their implementation efforts and, uh, and ask questions and th it, can, it builds discussion on topics so that we aren't reinventing the wheel there. And then also, there's a current effort serving sites about genomic medicine, about the genomic medicine data pipe pipeline. And so that's another uh, contribution where you're, they're getting community input. So, I'm going to skip over these last ones, but um, the summary of this presentation is really we can learn from efforts in the broader CDS community to help address challenges for, gen for genomic clinical decision support, and impl implementation science models can be complemented by existing frameworks to guide uh, understanding challenges and approaches to implementation. Uh, we also should consider for further investment in planned and underdevelopment tools, such as the four that I, we presented, I presented here. And the design of tools can be extended um, uh, 
to support precision medicine. And there's a whole uh, section on precision medicine, so I skipped over some of those slides. But um, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Uh, any clarifying questions? Remember, we'll have the bigger discussion in a little bit. All right, in the absence of, of that, um, we'll, uh, Larry Babb from the Broad Institute will be uh, up next, uh, talking about some of the bi-directional data flow that he's been uh, pioneering over the years.